episode 31. We are live. Yep, we're oh, live. Boy. So, hi everybody. Episode 31. I just want to thank Evan McRae for this amazing drawing of Bailey. These are some of my favorite gifts to get. Handmade ones, so thank you so much. Sharon, if you're watching, your son has real talent. Hopefully he'll be an animator or something like that. All right, we got everybody on. Are you watching? Are they listening? We got, yep. Okay, so guys, Kenny had to go to his niece's graduation today, so we have the lovely Eden, who's been training with us vigorously for the last two weeks, asking the questions today and monitoring the feed. And remember, if you don't get your question asked, answered live right now, I always go back, always, and answer them during the feed. And you can always submit a question. That's probably the best way on my website, www.eatunprocessed.com. So officially, we will start now. And welcome to episode 31 of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. And this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. So what do you have for me today, Eden? And hopefully they can hear me. Maybe this mic really isn't working. We've got it plugged in, so I know a few of you have commented on YouTube why, so I'm not really sure how to test it. Maybe I can ask Jeff Nelson who recommended it. So, question about vitamin B12. Mm -hmm. Could a person's vitamin B12 intake be causing their skin to break out? This woman wrote that she had amazing, perfect skin since becoming whole food, plant-based mm -hmm. a year ago. In the past two months or so, she's gotten these huge underskin acne spots that hurt. The only thing she's doing differently that she can think of is that she's taking vitamin B12 regularly. Right. So, again, not a doctor, but realize that cause doesn't always equal effect. So, of course, you should go to a doctor and ask a doctor this question. I believe you said you were in the San Francisco area and wanted a recommendation of a doctor in that area. I don't know somebody exactly in San Francisco, but you are so close, 45 minutes to the True North Health Center. So why not go there and see one of their amazing medical doctors like Dr. Anthony Lim, Dr. Michael Clapper, Dr. Peter Sultana, wonderful naturopathic doctors like Dr. Vares. So that's what I would do because you really are so close and some of these doctors even have weekend appointments. But what I would say is if you want to test this for yourself first, just stop taking it. Not forever, but you'll be fine if you don't take it for a few days or even a week. because. It's, it's very possible that it's not the B12 itself that's doing that, but the formula. So maybe take a different brand. Maybe the liquid drops aren't going to do that for you. It, it could be the formula because there's other things in a vitamin unless you're doing just the pure drops. And even then, in the solution, that could be the culprit. Do you understand what I'm saying? So like just the B12 is probably not doing it. Like if you got a shot or a patch of B12, it could be the formula. So I recommend... You either stop taking it and see if your skin clears up, try a different formula, but better yet, go to one of the True North medical doctors and ask, and I'm sorry about your skin breaking out because I know that's not fun, And but it's great that it's been so beautiful from eating a plant-based diet, but it certainly could be that you're allergic to or sensitive to one of the ingredients in the formula rather than the B12 itself. I hope that makes sense. And if you're not in the San Francisco area, you can still go to True North by doing a phone consult or a Skype consult. It's $95. It's wonderful, and you can also go to a website called www.vegdocs.com and see if there's a plant-based doctor in your area. There may be one, in fact, in San Francisco, but I can only name the ones in Los Angeles because that's where I live. So thank you for the question. Balin says that he is a personal trainer and close to plant-based, and one of his clients recommended you to him. He was wondering if you find that people make the same excuses for not following your dietary recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> they do to, to live and they go to a trainer. Well, first of all, I love your name, Balin, because it's just very similar to Bailey, and I, I love that name. So uh, thank you for the question. First of all, you say you're close to plant-based, so how can we get you plant-based? Please share with me what that means, because uh, you know if you're close to plant-based, you're not plant-based. So what is in your diet right now that you feel you need or can't give up that is making you not plant-based. So if you're watching, please tell me that. But I, I absolutely, you know, I've been vegan for 40 years now, or at least September 1st, I will have been vegan for 40 years. And even before I lost weight or started running the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, I was just encouraging people to eat more healthfully and eat plant-based. And people would always use the same two excuses why they couldn't eat healthfully. They didn't have enough money 
and they didn't have enough time. And, and now I've pretty much heard every excuse in the book, which is one of the reasons I wrote my book on process. I have a whole section about what I call yabbits, because anytime somebody uses the word but, or the word because, it's an excuse. And I believe that if you really wanted to do something, whether it's commit to a regular exercise program like you have people do, or lose weight, or eat healthily, you would do it. And that you can only do one of two things. You can either commit to the program, or you can commit to the excuses. And I believe that what people do when they make excuses is that they attempt to have a rationalization or justification for something that they don't really want to do, at least not wholeheartedly in the first place. But it allows them to save face and to, to keep status with other people. Because, to give you an example, so if, let, let's say that, you know, uh, you, everything in your life was just perfect. You know, you were married to the man of your dreams, you had a, lived in a mansion, you had all the money in the world, and you still couldn't get healthy. And by the way, it's very difficult, by the way. This problem is, is a difficult problem to solve. That's why three-fourths of Americans are overweight and more than half of them are obese. We are not dissolved to, si to solve this problem, the problem being the pleasure trap. It's the environment that caused the problem. It's completely unnatural, and our brain is not equipped to solve it, which is why, once again, the environment is the most important predictor of your success. But let's say everything in your life was hunky-dory, peachy, keen, peachy clean. I don't know what I'm thinking. And, and you still couldn't do it, well, then you'd probably feel really bad about yourself. But if your dog died and your husband was abusive and you know you had a horrible childhood, and I'm not saying these things are not devastating, they are, but if you have a quote legitimate excuse, you can use that and so people will understand, well, of course you can't do this. But the truth is, is life is stressful for everybody I know that's breathing. It's very hard, some people harder than others. You know, one of the things I learned from uh, my mother, very early on, which sounds cruel, is that life is not fair, and Dr. Lyle has reiterate, reiterated that with me in many sessions. It is hard, and it's always going to be hard, and it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, because I've had people do the program and lose 100 pounds, even while their spouse was dying of cancer. And I'm not saying these things aren't devastating, and you have to deal with them, but the reality is, is if you really wanted to do this, and by this I mean you know, lose weight or eat healthily, you would and nothing would stop you. And the reason we know that is a couple of reasons. Is if there was a way, look at The Biggest Loser, for example. There was a prize, I don't know what the prize was, but the people, they gained their weight back, most of them. But while they were competing and while there was this carrot dangling in front of them, they were able to do it. Maybe they weren't able to sustain it, but they were able to do it. And I am pretty sure that once we found out what motivates you, you would be able to do it. For a lot of people, it's money. And I'm pretty sure that if I said to you, I would give you a million dollars or whatever sum of money would be just irresistible to you, you would do it. It may be difficult, but you would do it. You, you could do it. If you ever watch that show, My 600 Pound Life, when they go to see Dr. Nozardian, they're, they can weigh anywhere from you know, 550 to 800 pounds. And he tells every single patient the same thing. Well, you need to show me that you can lose 50 pounds this month doing the diet or I can't operate. And he makes it sound like that he can't do the bypass surgery unless they are at a certain weight. When the reality is it's not much difference if you weigh 750 or 800 in terms of you know the risks of anesthesia and things like that. But he does that because the diet that he gives them to follow before the surgery is the same diet they have to be on afterwards. It's a diet I completely disagree with. It's basically a paleo diet. It's, it's no carb. It's just meat and vegetables, 1,200 calories a day. So I don't agree with it in terms of what he's feeding them and that he's also doing calorie restriction. But the point is, is when they have the gastric bypass surgery, that carrot dangled in front of them, even though they have been obese their entire life and have said nothing works, all of them lose weight that month. All of a sudden now, these people that have been in bed for two years and said they can't lose weight no matter what they do, have lost 50 pounds in a month because they've got that carrot dangled in front of them, the operation. So the point is, is if you really want to do this, you would do it because if you're committed, you find a way. If you're interested, you'll find an excuse. And I do find that most people make excuses and the ones they, that don't, once they stop, they. They, they succeed, and that's how I feel about excuses. And there's no such thing as a legitimate excuse. An excuse is still an excuse. It's your reason for not doing something because a part of you, especially if you're a food addict, you really don't want to do it because you're giving up your drug, you're giving up your high. You know, I used to be a respiratory therapist, 
and a lot of people had emphysema and COPD and lung cancer and asthma, they still couldn't quit smoking. And you know what addicts do is they negotiate. And so, you know, the doctors would tell them they have to quit smoking if they want to recover from lung disease. And their response would be something akin to saying, well, how many cigarettes can I smoke and what kind? No, you can't smoke any if you got lung disease. You shouldn't smoke any anyway. But, but that's what add, addicts do, they bargain. And the addict part of you doesn't want to do this because if you really did, you would have done it already. And is it difficult? Yes, but it can be done. And we're seeing more and more people do it. We're getting more and more Shadas out there now and Kristens and Tammies and Heathers and people that are just, every day on Tuesday, they're sending me something called Transformational Tuesday Pictures. If you join Ultimate Weight Loss, you know what I'm talking about. And these are people that are generally quiet on the boards. They don't interact much. And I see these pictures and I'm like, oh my God, you've lost 200 pounds. So it can be done. Is it difficult? Yes. That's what's great about Ultimate Weight Loss is we provide the support that a lot of people seem to need that is the missing piece. And of course, a, a, a diet that will get you there. A lot of people are loving what you're saying. Oh, thank you. Um, Julie's asking if you can talk about the different types of rice, are there any types you think should be avoided? You know, again, you know, I don't want to ever go against what any doctor says at all. And I know that Dr. Greger talks a lot about the arsenic in rice. And, you know, I believe him. I believe that that's what the research shows. I don't let things like that scare me because I love Texmati rice. It's probably the most arsenic containing rice, the rice from Texas. I rinse it well, you can boil it. I don't avoid it. I don't avoid acrylamides or, or, or charring my food just because Dr. Greger says that he speculates that that could be a problem because I feel that I follow an A plus diet. I followed a vegan diet for 40 years and pretty much an A plus diet like this close to Dr. Goldhammer for five years. So I don't worry about that. I feel that people tend to sometimes major in minor things and worry about the minutia instead of the big picture. I think that if I think if though if you're concerned about it, then that that is something that, that you know. If you're afraid that this could be a possibility, then don't eat something that you're afraid of. Some people don't do as well with grains as they do with other starches like legumes, or the my favorite category, which are the potatoes, the sweet potatoes, the squashes, the ones that are actually lowest in caloric density. You know, you could live on potatoes. I'm not suggesting you do but you couldn't live on grains or legumes because they lack vitamin A and C. And so, you know, I think that gluten should probably be avoided by a lot of people more than are necessarily avoiding it. You'd have to refer to my teleclass with Dr. Goldhammer where he talks about the link between such an increase of Hashimoto's thyroiditis and gluten. And, and if you're not eating bread or pasta, if you're eating the unprocessed diet that I recommend, the only gluten you would be getting anyway are in a few grains like barley, and wheat and rye and then oats if they're not gluten free. Oats don't have gluten but they're often sourced in a factory that has gluten containing grains or grown somewhere around there. So it's not really, if, if you're not, if you're only eating whole food, you're not really giving up a lot by not eating gluten. You're not eating couscous and barley, you know, things like that. So I think that most people that I've encountered feel better, do better on a gluten free diet. You can certainly test that for yourself. You know, you there is tests for celiac disease of course, and some of them are more sensitive than others depending on what doctor you go to. And apparently there's all these new antibodies that the more sophisticated doctors like Dr. Saron Kalsa and Beverly Hills test for because a lot of people actually have what's called non-celiac gluten intolerance. But you don't even have to go to the doctor. What you can do is just don't eat it for like a month and then eat it and see how you feel. I'm all for using yourself to, to test these things. So I don't think there's any grains that people have to avoid. I think processed grains. They, have, they don't have to avoid, but if weight is an issue, if food addiction is an issue, you don't want to be powdering your grains into a flour or into, pro, into uh, um, pasta or bread. I think that people should seek diversity in grains. You know, I, I tend to do this too and just eat the typical oats and rice because I like them. But now what I'm doing is I'm eating a lot of wild rice, which is, uh, we have these categories of grains that are called pseudo grains because they're botanically not grains. It's called wild rice, but it's actually a grass. Super healthy, actually super delicious, has a nutty toothsome texture. Quinoa is actually uh, a seed. Buckwheat, I think people should look into some of the grains that they're not eating as much, like the ancient grains, like amaranth, teff, millet. Millet is delicious, by the way, and anything you can do with rice or oats, you can do with millet. So I don't think there's necessarily anything 
each person has to avoid unless it's a problem for them. And, and that's how we're different because what could be a, an allergen or an intolerance or a trigger food for one isn't for the other. We are all different that day. You know, the only thing I recommend that everybody avoid is animal products and processed oils and alcohol. I don't think that everybody has to avoid sugar, flour, and salt. But if you're a food addict and if you're overweight, I think maybe you do. Thanks for the question, Julie. Um, Colleen asked live, do you think in order to, to succeed with UWL, it's important to believe that you will? I've been struggling at seeing the forest through the trees. Well, you know, hmm, that's more like a metaphysical question, which I love and I have to think about it. I think that I stand by my original statement is that the environment is the number one predictor of your success. And what I mean by that, I'm really big into metaphysical things. We're doing a book club now based on You Can Heal Your Life, both in person and in the mastery program. And I know like a lot of the psychologists poo-poo that affirmations. I'm big on that. I've always been, not always, but for 30 years I've been a believer in that. But at the same time, if I could drop you off at True North, or if you lived in my house, and by the way, we have a young lady living here right now. I'm doing what's called a beta test. Somebody that relapsed and gained 50 pounds back that they lost because I'm trying to figure out how to get inside the mind of a food addict and help people which is why if you're on the ultimate weight loss program we are starting a 30-day challenge tomorrow that's different than all the other ones we've done that's targeted for relapse that even if you didn't believe in yourself and even if you did negative affirmations that if I had you here you would be skinny because everybody that I've really worked with that way has ended up skinny or if we could drop you off at True North or if I could drop you off to live with the Tower of Humara Indians or any of Papua New Guinea or any of those people. So I still think at the end of the day, it's the food and it's the environment. But do having positive beliefs and affirmations help? Certainly, because I think they make you feel better emotionally. And if you feel better emotionally, you're probably more likely to get up and do healthy habits like exercising, like meditation, and like eating vegetables for breakfast. So. Can you succeed even if you don't think you can? Absolutely. But will it help you to believe you can? Sure. Because what's that saying? If you think you can, you're right. And if you think you can't, you're also right. So it's a great question and I've never thought about it before. So thank you. I think do both. Feed the mind, feed the body, but clean up the environment because that is going to be the deal breaker. If there's anything in your house that shouldn't be in your mouth, it's got to go because it's not a question of if you will eat it, only when. And what people don't understand, the client that I have here right now, it's an interesting situation because uh, she's vegan for ethical reasons and her husband is not and he has no interest in becoming vegan and he also drinks alcohol. And so there are foods in the house that she won't touch because she's vegan, like let's say frozen pizza that's, that's not vegan or uh, alcohol which Alcohol can sometimes be vegan, often it's not, but she doesn't drink anymore. And ice cream that's not vegan. She goes, well, it's not a problem. I'm not going to uh, touch it. I still believe, and from what I understand from interviewing other psychologists, and I don't have all the interviews out yet, but I took a course in called The Addictive Brain with a college professor. Is there something called associative cues? And even if you don't believe in that, the problem is, is we have memory, sense memory. So one of the reasons people get so attached emotionally to food is because of the memories that surround it. So if, if on Thanksgiving you have to eat pecan pie, even if you're on a special diet and maybe that's not even your favorite pie, sometimes it's because your very favorite aunt when you were seven made this for you and you associate the love from your aunt with the pie. And so you have memories around food. And the problem with having pizza and ice cream in the house, even if it's not vegan and you're an ethical vegan won't eat it, is what happens is you know it's there, it wears on you, and it causes you to have memories of like, gosh, you know, I remember I used to eat pizza. I used to, or I, you know, there's this place uh, where you can get vegan pizza, or this place you can get vegan ice cream. And I think what happens is it wears on you and you start thinking about how good it might be to have pizza and ice cream, because you can get vegan pizza and ice cream. And I just think that it's just not a good idea to ever have it in your house. And you know, we, we've talked ad nauseum about how to get it out, but at the end of the day, I really believe if something is in your house that is not serving you on some level you want it there, or you would get rid of it. 
Nice. So, Susie Gerlich says she finally broke down and got the Benson sample pack, <laughs> including table broke tasting. Broke down? I mean, she's been scrimping and saving all these years. I'm just teasing. I love that. I love the way you phrased it. Her question is, table tasty acts like salt in that it makes kale or potatoes or rice taste better than plain. How is that different than salt making food hyperpalatable? I understand salt is bad because it has other ill effects, but hyperpalatable is hyperpalatable, right. right? So yes and no. And 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 I love your questions. And and again, she's in mastery, and I love that like the degree that the level of that I have to think to answer your questions because there's not a straight yes or no answer with this. Yes, hyperpalatable is hyperpalatable, and what is hyperpalatable to you may not be hyperpalatable. It's a hard word to say. Hyperpalatable to me. So there's a few things going on here. And yes, you're right, it does make food taste better. And so the question is, is where somebody is in their recovery and their weight loss journey. Because somebody starting out, Susie, and, and I know this because I see that Dr. Clapper gives the table tasty to his patients that are really struggling. Because if they will not eat any of the food, they're not gonna get well. And so for somebody early on that just comes in there on the standard American diet with all these lifestyle diseases and, and is expected to eat the true north food, which to me is delicious, but when you first go there, it's not because you're not used to eating a diet without sugar, without fat, without salt. He gives them table tasty to help the food taste better so that they will eat it. Now you're at a point where you know how to cook really well and the food tastes pretty good, so you may not need it. And I really don't use table tasty to make my food better. I do use it in a couple of recipes where the salt is important to the recipe. So say the enlightened faux parmesan, where I'm trying to create parmesan cheese, and what's cheese but fat and salt, it, 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 if it's not in that recipe, then it's not gonna work in the context of that recipe. And I think I only put it in, how many recipes? It's in the smoking butternut bisque. It's really, really in, in very, very few of my recipes. So I don't use it as, as, you know, on a regular basis. So what we have going on with the Table Tasty, and we talked about this a few episodes ago, and I actually called uh, Debbie Benson, who created it, is there is some citric acid in it. And she is not doing that to trick you so that you will eat more and buy more. But the citric acid is not only a preservative, but what it is is that is how she creates the salty flavor. And we know from Mark Schatzker, who wrote The Dorito Effect, that a lot of co companies companies, not countries, are using things like that to actually, to do these flavor enhancers to make us like it more like they do with the sugar and the salt and the oil. Debbie Dett Benson, I can promise you, isn't doing it for that reason. She's doing it because as a chef, she's trying to create a flavor, flavor profile. But if you're somebody that's sensitive to that, that could be making you eat more. Is it a problem if you're using it on vegetables? I don't think so because I'm trying to encourage people to eat more vegetables. So it, you don't have to have Benson's Table Tasty, but I think for somebody that has a real missing of salt and that can't do a healthy eating program because they miss salt so much, I think it's a step in the right direction and better than using miso and tamari. I mean, just using fresh herbs is probably you know, the best thing you can do. Now here's the thing. It's not just ta Table Tasty, Susie. Anytime you season the food, it makes it more hyper palatable. And I wouldn't say that Benson Table Tasty creates like a hedonic eating experience where you're just gonna go into an orgy and, and not stop eating because of Benson's Table Tasty, like some people actually could with real salt because real salt really, really is an appetite stimulant. It, it really is for everybody and you do eat more food. So I did a teleclass with Dr. Erwin Linsner at True North and he talked about how anytime you season your food, even with herbs, even, you know, even with healthy herbs, it does make it more hyper palatable, more pleasurable, and you will eat more. So is that a bad thing? I don't think so. And when people have a lot of weight to lose, I think making the food as enjoyable as possible is gonna help them stick with the program. So this is a great question and it has many layers. And I think for other people, and especially people that really suffer from the ill effects of, Ill, Ill, I can't talk today, sorry about that, ill effects of salt that have high blood pressure, that have heart disease, things like that. I think this could be a good step, much better than the fake salts like the potassium chlorides. So yeah, I, I, I agree with everything you say and the question is, is we have to find out what is best for you. And, but, it, it, but see again, it's, I love that you're doing this because it's a good experiment. I, I, I don't wanna say I struggle with salt, you know, like I'm not sitting there putting salt on my food, I don't have any salt in the house except for Epsom salt, but I do slide back into having condiments with salt, like salsa, ketchup, and mustard. 
not because I necessarily think they taste better, but because it's just such a convenience. But I know that when I make my air fries and use the ketchup unsweetened with salt, I eat way more than if I don't. It doesn't affect my weight, it doesn't affect my health, but I don't feel good eating more than my body needs because I'm getting sensitive now to the effects of overeating even on healthy food. And it is possible that for you, that's what Table Tasty is doing. Thank you for the great question. Someone wrote in saying, I am a marriage and family therapist who is now working in a drug addiction treatment center and I just want to say that I agree with everything <laughs> you said last week about the environment and that I would like the people in that situation to know that a loving mate will support them in making lifestyle changes. If they won't, they've got bigger problems yeah. than just addiction. Yeah, and I wish, I wish I could put the person's name but they said no. But I appreciate you writing that because it breaks my heart when I hear from people, either in email or in the Facebook group, that don't have a clean environment and that haven't even asked. And they say, well, I could never ask my husband. I could never ask my children to give up these foods. And I'm like, what do you mean you can't ask? I mean, you're a family and like family has the back of each other. Why couldn't you even ask? And I agree with that because that's what one of the psychiatrists when I was at True North said that if somebody won't support the family and lifestyle changes, that, that's a problem. I mean, it's a problem in the relationship. So in other words, it's not a microcosm. This environment of food in the home, when I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, and you know, you can tell me like I'm the exception, that it's always some kind of imbalance of power or status in the relationship, and that if the, if, if the spouse says, no, we're gonna have it my way, that's not the first time they've said no. And that um, I, I do see people where once the spouse and family understands, once we actually sit them down, and by the way, if you're in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, I will Skype for free, it has to be Skype, it can't be phone, but I will Skype because I need to see the people to articulate this to your family and your husband or your wife, if it's a guy, and explain this to them. And so far, nobody's taken me up on that. So what does that tell you? You know, some people I think are embarrassed to uh, have this problem and, and maybe acknowledge that they do suffer from food addiction. If, you, if you're embarrassed, don't call it food addiction. Just have a sensitivity to refined carbohydrates, just like somebody has a sense, I have a sensitivity to legumes. I mean, I'm not embarrassed about that. But I do think that if you will not even talk to your spouse and children, about this, I mean, if you're if you're not struggling, fine, have anything you want in your house, I don't care, you know, this is not a court ordered program, but if you are somebody who says you want to recover from food addiction and you want to lose weight and you haven't done so and you still have an unclean environment, I don't see how I or any program can help you. Because every time somebody relapses in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, the first thing I say is where'd you get it? And they always say in their house. So I'm not sure how any program or any person can help you if you're not willing to clean up your environment. And what I would encourage you to do, and this is why I so badly want to talk to your family members if you're in UWL, is couldn't they do it for 30 days? Couldn't we do an experiment for 30 days where they just agree for 30 days, they just eat all the crap out of the house and see if anything changes. And if it doesn't, you can go back to having crap. But the thing is, is you guys have never had the experience of a clean environment and the calm brain because if you did, and then you had the slender body that is a result of having the clean environment, you wouldn't be fighting me on this. So either on some level, you just do not want to recover from the addiction because you still want this stuff in the house to feel safe for when you want it. Because the truth is, is if it wasn't in your house and you had the urge for it, you would have to go out and get it. And then you really have to feel like the addict that you are, getting putting on your clothes at 11 o'clock and driving. Whereas right now, you can blame the other person, again, with the excuses. You can just blame your children, blame your husband for having the food in your house. So thank you, marriage and family therapist, for saying that, I, and, and I agree, a loving mate, a loving family will support somebody making these changes. And uh, you need to have the self-esteem to ask for what you need. And unfortunately, According to Dr. Lyle, in one of the great talks he gave at the McDougal Event Study Weekend, the number one predictor of self-esteem in a woman is her weight. And I've noticed that as the weight goes up, the self-esteem goes down. So you want that self-esteem up, get that weight down. And then you're not going to have a problem asking. It's just going to be your way. Hence, skinny bitch. So what can I tell you, you know? Uh, and if you want your self-esteem to go up, by the way, the best way to do it, and the quickest way, because even if you lose weight, it's not going to be overnight, 
is to exercise and most people aren't doing that. So Lainey wrote in and says she has discovered that she's really enjoying enjoying sugar snap peas as well as sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. is, are there too is there too much sugar, sorry, in yeah. having those together as a snack no. or is eating them together compliant for weight loss? I don't think you ever have to worry about the amount of sugar in whole natural food. I mean, and I'm talking about whole. So I'm not talking about eating dried fruit or eating dates. You know, I wouldn't recommend somebody eats 50 bananas, but you're talking about a non-starchy vegetable and a starch that's a, a match made in heaven. So please, you know, people say, well, um, can't eat carbs, it's gonna turn to sugar. Everything turns to sugar. That's the whole point of eating is so you get glucose for your brain and your muscles to work on. So it's absolutely not too much sugar at all. I mean, you know, if you're eating 50 pounds of potatoes, it might be too much food, but not at all. Mine is sweet potatoes and broccoli. You're doing a great job eating those foods. And, and please don't worry about that at all, you know? And I mean, I'm assuming you're not diabetic, but even if you are, sweet potatoes are great and, and, not, and beans, things like that are really great for people that are, that are diabetics, you know? Um, unless you are diabetic, you do need to monitor your blood sugar and it's possible, I, I'm gonna retract what I said about too much sugar. It's possible that if you are diabetic, certain meals are, will raise your blood sugar in a favorable way for you, but if you're diabetic, you're checking that but that's the reason we want to eat the vegetables with the other things is so that we can mitigate the effect of that. You know, when you're eating food in its whole food form with the fiber intact and the water intact and the nutrients intact and it, the sugar, it, you don't get those blood sugar spikes, which is why we recommend fruit instead of fruit juice or, or, or even smoothies and things like that. But I think you're doing great. So rock on. More potatoes, more vegetables. Dana from Cincinnati, Ohio says, my weight loss is almost to the point where I'm ready to do some surgical alterations. Ooh. You are always so good at providing information. So although my questions are not directly about weight loss, they are regarding the outcome from weight loss. They are about researching certified plastic surgeons. You see, I'd love to get a tummy tuck. So can you help me out? Where do I begin? What do I look for? Any advice at all? I'm assuming Shada has had some tucking to get that rockin' body <laughs> oh she has, so I didn't know if she'd be willing to discuss. Thank you again for all that you do. Most days I feel you are the only friend I have as my social media life is, my social life is non-existent since I'm not willing to compromise my health and participated, participate in their SAD, Standard American Diet, worldly ways. This lifestyle can really be a lonely one, but damn, I'm gonna look hot living it. Oh, fantastic. Well, well, okay, so a few things there. And, you know, one of the things I recommend to everybody before they even start their weight loss journey is to please exercise. Because the thing is, is I lost only 50 pounds. Shada's lost over 100. And I have way more loose skin than Shada. And the reason is, is because Shada has been a lifelong exerciser. And because of that, her skin didn't, didn't do that when she lost weight. So she didn't need an operation because she always exercised. She was always very fit, even when she was at her heaviest. And that really makes a difference when you have muscle underneath instead of just, you know, nothing. So I would recommend that if you're not exercising now, you start a program and, and especially if you're hoping to lose weight. And it doesn't mean that you still won't have loose skin because everybody's different and depends on how much you have. I know a few people that have had that operation and they were pleased with the outcome but they said it was miserable. In other words, like while they were recovering, they were like, why did I do this? Because it's really, really, really painful. I would encourage you to watch a television show on TLC called Skin Tight, where they do those kind of surgeries. It's so hard to watch. These people go through so much pain. So just know that it's really, really, it's major surgery. So how do you find a good doctor? Well, referrals are always the best. You know, obviously you look on health grades and, and those kind of websites, ask your own doctor. You're in Cincinnati, Pam, I, you know, I wonder if any of the plant-based doctors in Ohio like Dr. Esselstyn or Dr. Popper would know one, but you wanna make sure that they're board certified in cosmetic surgery because believe it or not, there are doctors and I know a few, they were like gynecologists and they took a weekend course and they're doing liposuction. Don't go to somebody that this isn't their day job. I don't know what it's like in Ohio, but in California, you can go to a plastic surgeon for free because the hope is, is that you will book the operation. Some of them do have a small fee for their consult, which you can apply to the operation, but I would get not one, not two, but three consults because you wanna be really, really comfortable with whoever you get. They'll have a book, you wanna see the pictures, but I would go one step further, and then once you find the one that you seem to like their work and their personality in the office, you know, I, 
I, when I go to an office, it's like the person at the front desk. Well, first of all, the, my first impression is the person on the phone. And if they're a bitch, I'm not going to go to that doctor. And then how do they greet you there? But once you find one you think you like, ask to actually speak to one of the patients. Don't just take the pictures to say I, because if they won't share that information, then I would worry, you know, I really would. Um, what else would, oh, so um, I don't know if she does consults, but we have a vegan plastic surgeon in Irvine named Wendy Olayo, and she is a phenomenal uh, doctor, and I wonder if, because I actually had a consult with her, and I, I'm not doing it because number one, it's so expensive, number two, it requires general anesthesia, and as vain as I am, my asthma is not gonna allow me to do that and either is Dr. Goldhammer, but uh, what's really cool about her is she will not operate on a smoker. And there's blood tests that they can give that shows if you've smoked even in the last 90 days because she feels they're not gonna get a good outcome. She's really awesome. And maybe I can ask her if she would do like a Skype or a phone consult because she would tell you what to look for in your area. So if you have the operation, good luck. The other thing I really suggest to people is before you run out and get skin surgery, Make sure that you maintain the weight for at least two years. And I'm not saying that if you can maintain it for two years, you'll maintain it forever. I mean, I'm at, I'm at over five years now, and you know the research shows that most people gain it back within two, but I would make sure that you can maintain it because the last thing you wanna do is go through a very expensive, very painful operation and then gain your weight back. And that's what we see sometimes happening with that surgery or gastric bypass. But once you're sure, then you know go for it. I think if, if it's gonna make you feel better about yourself, then do it, you know, or Wear Spanx, you know? I mean, you know, every time I show, you know, Dr. McDougall, he goes, J just live with it. You know, it's like, all right, you know, what are you gonna do? So Dana, who asked a question, is here with us. Uh -huh. And Shada just commented. She said, no, I've never had a tummy tuck, but remember, I've never had a child and I've always worked out. Lots of cardio oh, and weights. That's right. When I was heavy, I used to work out two to three hours a day and yeah. I still do, but what I've learned right. is that you can't out exercise a right. bad diet that's true thank you shade i didn't even think about that because you know when i think about it you know my former roommate who really wasn't even overweight and has had several children and some of them by cesarean she recently had that operation and she wasn't really overweight at all but for some reason she, yeah mm. it's a good point i didn't even think about that yeah shada is never bore a child no sorry. <laughs> Not to my knowledge. She says I but still But she is single and very hot if any males are watching. And she said, by the way, I still work out six days a week, cardio and weights. Make sure you stay hydrated, which is very important. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean nobody I mean I, I just uh, I can't keep up with Shada, you know. I mean I it's like I, I do like the minimum amount of exercise to get the desire. She she's she's addicted to that. And she was before is she that the interesting thing is she was even when she was heavy. So Again, that's a great lifelong habit that really served her because when she lost weight, yeah, she does have a rocket body. Let me tell you something. I took her as my guest to Rancho La Puerta. I will not wear a bikini. That girl has a smoking body. And there's and if, if she had surgery, I mean, I would have. I think I would have seen it. I mean, I don't feel, there's not usually anything with scars. I mean, she looked amazing. And she's, you know, I'm jealous of her body. <laughs> but she's short. Nah. How do you like that, Shady? You're short. <laughs> um, so Denise wrote in she says I am 25 years old and my sister and I became vegans about six months ago six months ago while watching some videos on YouTube I came across your video from fat vegan to skinny bitch great video and started watching more of your videos I can say I have watched all of your weight loss Wednesday videos and I finally have the courage to ask you this question one have you ever made oat groats in the instant pot if so what is your grow to water ratio and how long do you cook them for? I have okay. never really liked oatmeal, but I like the consistency of oat groats made on the stove. I purchased oat groats after watching one of your videos. I Short purchased, questions, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I purchased an Instant Pot after watching many of your cooking videos on Foodie TV and it has saved me so much time when making a variety of meals. Making oat groats on the stove takes about 45 to 50 minutes and making them in the Instant Pot would be faster. However, every time I try to make it in the Instant Pot, it comes out like brown rice, somewhat dry and rice-like. On the stove, they come out creamy, just using water. Not sure how to recreate the texture in the Instant Pot. Side okay, note. I, I think I get the question. <laughs> okay. Get the side note in a minute. So it's so funny because one of the questions which we didn't ask but I'm going to ask it now is do you make up these questions? And I'm like, you really think that if we were going to make up questions, we would make up long questions. Not to, I don't want to make you feel bad. I'm just teasing. But try to be more succinct if you guys can. Uh, so I wrote down, I saw this question. Again, if you tuned in late, look at this beautiful drawing of Bailey by artist Evan McRae. So I asked Sharon, and she, uh, I haven't made them yet in the Instant Pot. 
uh, but she says she uses the manual setting for five minutes, two cups groats with three cups boiling water. She lets the pot sit for at least a couple hours after coming down to pressure because she doesn't like oats mushy and that this way they're more like rice. So if you like them mushy, don't let it, then eat it right away because you're saying it's like rice. I think oat groats are delicious and it's my favorite way to eat oats because it's the wholest form. Then we have the steel cut, then we have the roll, and then we have the instant. So it's, it, they're delicious and they are, they are quite like rice. So what was her side note? You said as a side note. Oh. Yeah. Um, she knows how you feel about eating oatmeal in the morning and how it might be cake for some people, but I am not, but she's not one of those people. It takes her about an hour to eat just half a cup of cooked wow. oat groats in the morning. It's a long she time. loves savory things in the morning, but she wants to make oat groats a breakfast option. Sure. And, and it's a great breakfast option. And you know, I, I don't, I don't think oatmeal is cake to everyone. I don't think oat groats are cake. I think what happens is when people are eating instant oats or rolled oats, and they're eating a lot of fruit with it, then it becomes cake to them because they're not eating the bread and the flour and they're not eating the sugar. So they have this breakfast of fruit and oats, which is a completely healthy breakfast. There's nothing wrong with eating it. But if you're trying to lose weight, you need to lower the caloric density of all your meals. And you do that with vegetables. And so there's so many reasons that I recommend vegetables for breakfast and savory, bre savory breakfast in general. And it really is, is really at the end of the day, it's about, it's about caloric density because it's really easy to eat oats because they're delicious. You know, I remember uh, when my sister, I was working with my sister, she was, I believe, a size 14, and then we worked together, she got down to a size four, and then her dog died and she got back up to a size eight, and this was before the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and I sent her, one time it was on DVDs, and she goes, look, I'm willing to eat two pounds of vegetables a day. You know, I can eat a pound with dinner or a pound with lunch, but I'm not eating them for breakfast. And why, you know, she, she basically is one of these people that loves oats for breakfast. She goes, well, because eating vegetables for breakfast, well, that would just be so sad, you know, because eating oats with fruit, that makes her happy. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with getting pleasure from your food. The thing is, is it depends what your goals are, because I don't know of any way to lose weight quicker than to implement the, the, the principle of caloric density. And I don't know of any food that can do that better than vegetables at 100 calories a pound. And so eat oats for breakfast, but eat vegetables too. So make half the plate vegetables. And then, I mean, because I think people think if they're not in ultimate weight loss or if they're in it, but they really haven't interacted in a meaningful way or, or read the materials or listened to the materials is that we don't just eat vegetables for breakfast, we eat vegetables first. And that just means you eat them, just like you know you, you brush your teeth or you, you, know, you uh, do your homework before going outside and play. We eat them and then right afterwards, if, if we're still hungry or maybe 20 minutes later, or it depends, everybody has different levels of satiety, different lanes, then you eat your delicious starch. And, and so we're not asking you not to eat oatmeal and fruit for breakfast. We're just saying, hey, have some vegetables first. It's sort of like if you watched our holiday webinars where we talked about um, preventing relapse during the holiday when, when all the experts were giving their opinion. And one of the things that was really uh, prevalent is they were saying, okay, you're gonna be at these parties and there's gonna be drinks and hyper palatable food. And so we're not telling you at the holidays that you can't indulge at all. What we're saying is just make it a rule that before you eat these treats, have something healthy first. And that's pretty common knowledge that if you've ever heard Dr. Lyle speak or really any of us, is that we can't tell you to never have these foods again. But what I say to people is just eat something healthy first. And it's sort of like, I'm not telling you not to eat oats. And, and fruit, I'm just saying, just eat some vegetables first. And that's all I'm saying because, you know, we know that the Ultimate Weight Loss Program works based on all the pictures we're getting for Transformational Tuesday and all the people that have lost, you know, over 200 pounds now and, and are keeping it off. But just because something works doesn't mean it doesn't work for, it's going to work for you because if you can't do it, it's not gonna work. And if you really listen to what I've been saying, probably since episode one, is that you should do the least restrictive program that you can do to get the result that you desire. And if another program is working better for you that's less restrictive, please do it. But the problem is for many people and for people that suffer from food addiction in particular, a more flexible program unfortunately doesn't work. And so I think that at the whole world should just do the McDougall program, absolutely. We would have very few rates of, of disease. 
The problem is there's a certain percentage of people, and I don't know, you know, I've heard one out of seven, I don't know the exact number, that are sensitive to the effects of refined carbohydrates like sugar, flour, and alcohol in their processed form because in their, in their whole food form, they're, they're whole grains and uh, or whole vegetables or you know and and so with these people the more liberal versions of the plant-based diet they don't work because they aren't the kind of people that can have a teaspoon of sugar on their oatmeal or a sprinkle of salt these and so for them i say do the mcdougall program for maximum weight loss which eliminates the sugar the flour salt and people say well eating vegetables for breakfast isn't mcdougall it's not not mcdougall if you really read the maximum weight loss program he talks about having your plate be anywhere from from one third to one half to two thirds depending on how hasty you want the weight loss vegetables and so just so so again you know vegetables are really the way to lower the caloric density of the meal but the even more important than that, if you're somebody that's suffering with cravings, we now have research that we didn't have, or at least I didn't have five years ago when I started, that shows that the vegetables, especially the dark green leafy ones, they turn off the hunger switch and they cause you to not have the cravings for the crap. So there's myriad reasons that we use them and they just work beautifully. I made the, on Memorial Day, I made a post about, you know, thanking the people that gave their life to, uh, for our freedom. And I said, you know, let's all of us be thankful that we have a program now that can uh, facilitate the freedom from food addiction because the freedom from food addiction, having that calm, stable brain, it feels much better than the addiction did. The thin body is, is, is just a result of it. But um, I don't remember what I was going to say. There's about 10% battery left. Oh, says. my goodness. So you know what? what we, all we have to do is, is there plug, plug in? this in. Yeah. There so we, go. we just have to lift this up. Oh, see? It, it, oh. How do we, this kind of usually gets an extension. Cord. One moment, people, and, sorry. Oh, boy. Um, but, oh, what about this? Gosh, hello. Oh, we're so ill-prepared. Will this work? Let's see. Let's try this. Let's try this thing. Okay, sorry about that. And I lost my train of thought, too. Something about freedom. Oh, it's not the right. Not the right one. Uh, try this one. Okay. See, we need a crew here, guys. Okay, I'm gonna, now i got to figure out my train of thought. And anyway, don't be bashing on Eden like you were Kenny, because these are volunteers, guys. These are people with real jobs that are helping me out. And if you think you can do better and make this broadcast better, then send me the mic you want me to use or come to my house and help me. Um, drink on food addiction. I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. I'll rewatch this and tell you what I was saying. Is it is it showing the little lightning bolt? That means it's working. Hmm... Or I'll have to, see, because now that you guys make me use a mic, I can't go over there and get the extension cord. I'll have to leave the broadcast. <laughs> All right? So what was I talking about? I'm sure it was going to be profound, and I'll probably think of it again in a minute. I don't know. I can't remember what you're saying either. But okay. yeah. let me say, um, Becky says she went to a family event recently, and they understand that she's vegan but not oil-free, and somebody made her a salad with oil, and um, they were so proud and what would you have done or said about that situation? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so, you know, going back to what Dana said about, uh, you know, like, uh, I'm her only friend now or whatever. I get it. It's, it's lonely. It's, 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 it's being, being different than other people. So, Becky, I don't know what your situation is. Because if you're somebody with heart disease, then it would be a deal breaker. It's like, absolutely not. It's hard because most women are people pleasers and... It's, it is very hard. These are skills that have to be learned. And so there's lots of things you can say. So so this was, she told them that she was oil free and they still made it anyway because it's a big difference if they... No, I don't think that's what yeah. she said. I think they just didn't understand. Right. So you got two choices. You can eat it or not eat it. And if you eat it, you're just going to have to suffer the consequences of any ill feelings you may get from the oil or feeling bad about yourself or compromising your program or possible... I wouldn't say you're going to gain weight from one meal, but sometimes when we eat these hyper palatable, high calorie, high fat foods, it causes us to crave more. Or you got to just be real honest and say, look, I'm so sorry I didn't articulate it, but I can't eat this. Or I'm allergic. Or when you got there, you could have said something to the effect of like, you know, I pull the host, this is what I love. So pull the host aside and say, look, I'm really sorry. 
but I got really sick today. I had I had some vomiting. I had some diarrhea. So please forgive me if I can't eat. Could could you give me a club soda or some tea? And then hopefully, if you're an ultimate weight loss, you know you never go to any social event without pre-eating, without having your purse with you, with your potato in it. it. That is the complex part of this, is the social interaction, if you if you are a people pleaser, if you're extroverted, and if you, if you really care. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I know what I think I wanted to say. And uh, w what I wanted to say is, is when we were talking about, uh, you know, the oatmeal for breakfast versus the vegetables for breakfast kind of thing, you know, it, it's not an all or none proposition. I think food addicts tend to look at everything as black and white, whereas either I'm going to do the ultimate weight loss program and be as perfect as AJ and Dr. Goldhammer, and I'm not as perfect as Dr. Goldhammer, or I'm just going to go out and binge and eat all the crap in the world. So either I'm going to strive for an AA plus diet, and if I can't do that, I may as well just eat enough. Well, I don't know about you guys, but do you remember like school? Like it wasn't pass fail. It was F, D, C, B, A, and there was minuses and pluses for every letter. And so what I'm learning now from working with the client that's living with me, who has been stuck in both the pleasure trap and the ego trap for months and gained all her weight back, is when we feel like we can't achieve a goal, we often fail boldly and miserably in front of people. This is called the ego trap because we're, not gonna, we're gonna show you I'm not gonna even try because if the bar is set too high, some people won't try. And so I realized that the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, the bar is set high, but for the people that can do it and for the people that have the medical necessity to do it, it does need to be set there. See, I don't wanna lower the bar for the people that can reach the bar. So what I would suggest, and again, this is maybe oatmeal for breakfast is the best thing if you can't do vegetables, is that there's lots of letters between F and A. And so when people can't do Ultimate Weight Loss, Instead of going back to McDonald's, what about getting my book on process that has 109 recipes that are free of sugar, oil, flour, and salt, and eating those? Now, you will not achieve ultimate weight loss. That's why it's called ultimate weight loss. It's not called best weight loss. It's not called only weight loss. People have lost weight just doing unprocessed. Now, the problem is, again, with caloric density, if all you choose to do is eat the 40 dessert recipes, you probably won't. You could conceivably gain weight. But what about the 50 recipes in there that are not dessert? These are not pleasure trap recipes in the same way that sugar and oil and flour and salt are. But why not do that? It's sort of like what Dr. Lyle talks about when you have to hit those starch targets. Do, do, do the most lenient program that you can do and get the results you want. But don't do no program. And that's what, what happens is people are either on or off. Well, what about everything in between? You know, if you can't get an A, isn't it better to get a C than to get an F? Because if you live at C level for a while, maybe you'll want to increase your grade to a B or an A. So, you know, I think that to go from the standard American diet to ultimate weight loss, it's sort of like when people go to True North, that's going to be a big shock. But most of the people that come to Ultimate Weight Loss have tried every other diet, and it's worked to them for them to a degree, and then it hasn't. This diet will work, whether or not you can do it. You know, maybe a session with Dr. Lyle would ascertain that if you have the perfect personality, which is one of his talks at Esteem Dynamics, to do it, we know that it works. Is it sustainable for you? I don't know. I really believe, though, if you're looking for your food for reasons other than hunger and survival to to feel happy, to uh, uh, not feel sad, to not feel depressed or anxious or bored or lonely, no diet style is gonna work for you very long unless you deal with what's really going on with you emotionally. Then, you know, if you were dealing with what was the real problem, maybe you could eat any diet style and, and not be overweight. But again, at the end of the day, it's the pleasure trap. And these foods are very addictive for most people, meaning the flowers, the sugars, and even some of the healthier high fat plant foods. And, you know, I almost feel like saying that until you're willing to clean up your environment, it doesn't matter what diet you do. It really doesn't. Because if it's in your house, it's in your mouth, it's not a question of if you will eat it just when. And I think until you're willing to at least give me 30 days and prove me wrong on that, because I don't think you will, I don't think it matters what diet you do. Because I don't want to say you're ultimately going to fail, but I think you ultimately probably will relapse. and you. If no other reason, you will struggle more than everyone else because you will have to rely on white knuckling and willpower to not eat these things. Whereas if they're not in your house, you don't have to 
resist them because they're not there. You don't even have to think about them because you're not seeing them. You know, today I got this uh, coupon package and I opened it up and it's like, oh my God, you know, pizza. And it's like, it's like I, I mean, I didn't meet, know that. I was looking for a car wash coupon, but it's like, it's, it's incredible. Like the, 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 the stimuli, the super normal stimuli of these foods, your environment, you're screwed. Anything else? Because we're all most out Yep, of time. one more oh, question. One more question, okay. Um, Jerry was wondering, do you have advice for people who do long commutes or have to spend hours in the car every day? Sometimes he has to be in the car for breakfast or lunch or yeah, both. Yeah, I know. Oh, and like, you know, I feel so bad because I, I don't know where you live or if you drive professionally, but like I've, 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 I've had a couple clients that were long distance truckers and, oh, that, that being in the car and that's, if you live in LA, you pretty much live in your car. It's the most, I think one of the most stressful things in the world. And so what you need to do is make sure that you're listening to something like a weight loss Wednesday, like one of the Dr. Lyle lectures. So you need to feed your mind while you're doing that because it, it, to distract yourself from that. Hopefully you've had some kind of exercise or, or movement before you get in the car because just, just you're, you're so compromised because we're sitting all day. That's why they say sitting is the new smoking. You know, I don't really recommend eating in cars, however, Obviously, if you're a trucker or if you're in the car for hours and you're hungry and you can't pull over, you might want to consider that. You're eating with distraction, but it's what you eat that's going to matter. So if you're munching on carrot sticks or jicama sticks or sugar snap peas and emotionally eating on that, I don't think it's a problem, but I think you want to make sure you have enough starch. That's why I always recommend people, especially people that have real jobs, to do what I call the potato hour. And most people do can do a pretty good job for breakfast and usually for lunch too, but those hours between lunch and dinner are tend to be for most people the longest. And that's when people, like you see if you have a regular job, they go to the coffee machine or they go to the vending machine. It's like at three or four o'clock and they're looking for a cup of coffee when they're looking for candy bar because they're, they're they're trying to wake themselves up. They're looking for stimulation when really their blood sugar is low and they probably need to eat. And so instead of going for the caffeine or the sugar, this is when you want to do the potato hour. Have a microwaved or a baked potato or, be, or a sweet potato and then get that slow burning fuel and you get the sweetness. And, and I really think that that is one of the best things you can do, even better for some people than having like fruit. That's, so that's what I would do. And I feel bad for you having to be in a car because that just makes me crazy being in a car more than anything. That's why I take the train so much. If there's a way you can commute, you know, also being in a car is very stressful. And when you have stress, you're depleting glucose. And so you will often have cravings or feel hungry. So you need to eat, but you just need to eat the right food. We've been going for 57 minutes. Well, Do you want to stop? Almost too long, unless there's anything else. So thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you so much, Eden. Kenny, we missed you. We still love you. We hope to see you back. And thank you guys so much for watching A Weight Loss Wednesday. Please consider signing up for the live Ultimate Weight Loss conference in Vegas in September and coming to see me in Vegas on June 9th, 10th, and 11th. Still tickets left for health, healing, and happiness. So thanks for watching episode 31. I'm Chef AJ and I truly believe you can have both the health and the body that you so richly deserve. Thank you.